Welcome back to another lecture for Bio3D Prep. Still talking about the properties of matter and the structure of matter. Here we're going to focus on elements, the periodic table, and atomic structure. By the end of this lecture, you'll be able to describe the physical and chemical properties of elements, and you'll be able to identify elements as being either a metal or a non-metal. You'll be able to identify the physical properties and subatomic structure of an element using the periodic table. Uh, you'll be able to define mass number and atomic number. You'll be able to define the term atom, element, and isotope. And you'll be able to apply Bohr's atomic theory to specific atoms. So we'll start by looking at elements. Elements share one, com one chemical property in common. They cannot be broken down by heat or electricity. So if you apply heat or electricity to an element, the only thing you're going to do is maybe change its state. You might make it gaseous or, or liquid by applying heat or electricity. There's about 90 of them that occur in nature. 25 more can be created synthetically. And elements can be classified or grouped into one of three groups based on their empirical properties. So based on things like state and uh, shininess, ducti ductileness, uh, they can be classified as either a metal, a non-metal, or a metalloid. Now before we go any further talking about uh, elements and atoms, every time we are observing something, we're observing, we're observing it under a set of conditions. So depending on the conditions, that will affect how a substance appears. For example, if you study water at minus 2 degrees Celsius, you're going to describe it as being ice. It's a white solid uh, substance that things don't dissolve in and a whole bunch of other stuff, but basically you're going to describe it as being ice. If you describe water at 10 degrees Celsius, well now it's a liquid. And if you were to describe it over 100 degrees Celsius, then you describe it as a gas. So depending on when you're looking at it, depending on the conditions around what you're looking at, that affects the way you can describe it. So most of the time, when scientists are describing something, they have to say uh, under what conditions that substance is being described by. So the same is true for all ele elements and compounds. So there's two generally accepted standards at which we use to describe substances. So there's SATP and STP. SATP is standard ambient temperature and pressure, 25 degrees Celsius, 100 kilopascals, description of most elements and compounds and reactions are assumed to take place at these conditions unless stated otherwise. Mostly because this is comfortable for people. STP is another set of standard conditions. Standard temperature and pressure is often used as well. This is at 0 degrees Celsius and 101.325 kilopascals. So normally we don't work in those conditions unless we have to, but if you have to, then that's what you use. Uh, if the conditions are different than either of those, uh, the scientist or the person describing whatever they're describing would have to say so. For metals and non-metals, here's what we know. At standard ambient temperature and pressure, all metals are shiny and bendable. They're good conductors of electricity. All of them except mercury are solid at room temperature and most elements are metals. So when we look at the periodic table, what we're going to see is over half of that table is composed of elements that, are, that have the same properties or the properties of metals. At SATP, non-metals are a little bit harder to describe. Uh, they're not shiny or bendable. They don't conduct electricity or heat in their solid form. Uh, most are actually gases, but their state is variable. Sorry, their state is variable. So some are liquids, some are solids, some are gases. Most of them are gases, but the state is variable, unlike uh, metals where all except mercury are solids at room temperature. When you finally get them in their solid form, they're usually brittle, but no guarantees. The last group of elements are the metalloids. And the metalloids are a bunch of elements that don't fit the metal definition or the non-metal definition. 
Some of them are shiny, some of them are dull. Some conduct electricity, others do not. Some conduct electricity when you change their temperature. Uh, all of them are brittle and not ductile. So these are the metalloids. On the periodic table, which we're going to be looking at in a couple minutes, they're the ones that touch the staircase. So what we're going to see in the periodic table is kind of a thick black line that goes like this down one end of the periodic table. That's the staircase. The elements touching the staircase are metalloids. So on the periodic table, uh, elements are grouped in families or vertical columns that have similar, similar chemical properties. The per periods are the horizontal rows. And when you go through a period, you're gradually going to see a change in physical and chemical properties from metal properties to non-metal properties. The staircase separates the table. It separates the metals from the non-metals. Those things touching, of course, are metalloids. And each element listed on the table is accompanied by several quantitative observations. Um, for those of you who are a little, uh, a little bit on the nerd side, you can actually get a periodic table for your iPod. Or your iPhone. Not that I have any uh, money invested in the iPhones, but I like it. It's kind of neat. Uh, what you're going to find usually is the English name the international symbol, the atomic number, the atomic mass, and its state under some set of standard conditions, usually ambient temperature and pressure. Here's an example of what you'll see on a periodic table. Uh, here is, in each box, you'll have an element. Here's the symbol. It's a two letter, it's a one or two letter symbol. The first letter is always capitalized. or uppercase. The second letter, if there is one, if there is one, sorry, is always lowercase. Uh, the atomic number will always be there. So in this case, iron's atomic number is 26. The atomic molar mass, when we round this number off using our normal rounding rule, so this we round to 56, this would be its mass number. And of course, it'll have things like boiling point, measured melting point. The other thing you should notice is that the font on your symbol tells you whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. If it's just normal type blocking, it's a solid at SATP. Uh, if it's italicized, then it's a liquid. And if it's shadowed, or if the letters are hollow, then it's gaseous at SATP. Black letters means it's a natural element. Green letters means it's means it's a thin set, thin set, thin, holy moly, synthetic element uh, that's only producible by man, or in the lab. So here's an example of a periodic table. Uh, notice that we have our metals on the left side non-metals on the right side and here's our staircase right here anything touching that staircase is a metalloid you'll also see at the bottom a couple of rows that are removed from the periodic table usually they fit in right here. The only reason they've been removed is to save space. If they weren't, if they were put back in the periodic table, it would be almost twice as wide as it, as it is now, and it just doesn't fit on a piece of paper very well. So that's the reason why the rows are removed and, and lowered down. Uh, if you take a look, here's the state key that we were looking at on the previous slide, and here's another description of the key of of an element. For each vertical column, uh, I'll go back one second here. For each vertical column, you notice they're numbered. So here's column one, column two, column three, all the way down to column 18. Each one of these columns has a group of elements that share similar chemical properties. 
and some of these columns have names. So the group or the column, some of them have names. Some of the groups that you should know, uh, group one, they're all solid at SATP, they're all metals. Uh, they're extremely reactive with oxygen, they're soft and shiny in their pure form, and they react with halogens to form common salts. So some examples include things like sodium. And you'll never see sodium in nature as a sodium metal. Sodium metal is a shiny, bendable metal, but it's so reactive that if you expose it to air or water, it reacts immediately to form sodium compounds that are white and crystalline. So that's why we think of, when we think of sodium, we think of a white crystal, but what we're really seeing is salt, not sodium itself. Group 2 metals, the alkali earth metals, are somewhat the same in terms of their chemical properties as, as the alkali metals. Uh, they're very reactive with oxygen. Uh, in a one-to-one -one ratio, they're also soft and shiny in their pure form. Again, most of these metals we don't see in their pure form because as soon as you expose them to the air, they react with the oxygen to become something else, to become a compound. Halogens, uh, on the other side of the periodic table, group 17, uh, their state varies at SATP. Some are solid, liquid, or gas. Extremely reactive. Uh, they even react with water to form acid solutions. So again, uh, we don't see a lot of these in nature as just uh, the substance itself. The final group is of special significance. It's the noble gases, group 18. Uh, the funny thing is, that even though they're special, we don't talk about them much, and the reason we don't is because they're boring. They're almost completely unreactive. Uh, in nature, you never find them in a compound. They always exist on their own, floating around, and so this is of special significance, significance to chemical theory. So those are the noble gases, group 18. Now atoms, we've said they're tiny positively charged spheres, or the nucleus. The nucleus of an atom, it consists of protons and neutrons. It's surrounded by a negatively charged cloud of electrons. And the electrons are much, much smaller than the protons, but they take up most of the space. This is most of the volume. of an atom. Whereas the nucleus is most of the mass. The charge on one proton is equal in magnitude to the charge on one electron. So even though they're different sizes and they take up different space, their charges are equal. One proton, one electron, same but opposite charge. Atoms have an equal number of electrons and protons, which means any atom should have a net charge of zero. Where that? Now we'll look at elements and isotopes. So elements, the physical and chemical properties of an atom is determined by the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. Two atoms that differ in their number of protons will be separate elements. This is how we move down a periodic table. As you add an a or as you add protons to a nucleus, you actually get different atoms. Isotopes are two atoms with the same number of protons or the same atomic number, but with a different number of neutrons. So they're going to have slightly different masses, where their mass number is going to be different. Isotopes are, are common. Most elements have at least one isotope. Many have more than one. Uh, isotopes that are unstable, so sometimes if too many particles get shoved into a nucleus, that nucleus gets too full, it's unstable, and it starts kicking particles out of the nucleus. And this emits energy, and this energy can actually be detected by a Geiger counter. And they're often used, these radioactive isotopes are often used in medical imaging technologies as well. So atomic number describes the number of protons present in the nucleus of an atom of an element. Each element has a unique atomic number. So an atom with 10 protons is going to be a neon atom. No questions about it. If you give an atom 11 protons, or if you find an atom with 11 protons, that's going to be a sodium atom. If you find an atom with 51 protons, it's going to be an antimony atom. The number of protons tells you what kind of element you're dealing with. Mass number, on the other hand, is a little bit different. It's actually the sum of 
protons and neutrons, or it's the total number of particles in the nucleus of an atom. The atomic number of an atom can change without changing the elements. So for example, in nature, there are two forms of oxygen. I'll just write them down here. There's oxygen 18 and oxygen 16. Both are oxygen, both have eight protons. They have to have eight protons because they're oxygen. Oxygen 18 has two more neutrons than oxygen 16, and so this is another name for this is actually heavy oxygen. So this here is heavy oxygen. It's useful to know this. Um, it's actually used in terms of uh, dating the Earth. And it's also related to the temperature of the Earth. So if you uh, study global warming at all, you'll hear about uh, heavy oxygen and light oxygen. This is what they're talking about. At different times in the Earth, Earth's history, the amount of heavy oxygen in the atmosphere has changed. And so if you can figure out how much oxygen was in the atmosphere at any given time, you can relate that to the temperature of the Earth during that time period, even though we weren't there. So that's another use for isotopes. If we're just taking a look at our periodic table, we should be able to tell how many protons, how many neutrons, and other kinds of things that uh, describe a particular element. So for example, here we have a bromine atom. The number of protons is the same as the atomic number. So 35, we have 35 protons. It's the same as atomic number. Let's make a U there, here we go. There we go, atomic number. The number of neutrons, we have to do a little bit of math. The first thing we have to do is round off our mass. So the mass number is 80. As we round off our 79.9, so the 79.9 gets rounded off to 80. From that, we have to subtract our atomic number. which is 35. We do the subtraction, we get 45 neutrons. It's a boiling point, so this is where it goes from a liquid to a gas. And if you check your key, you'll find that it's the first number, so the boiling point is 59 degrees Celsius. Its state at ambient temperature and pressure, we can tell that by the shape of our symbol. So when we look at the BR, it's italicized. Which means at room temperature, it's a liquid. When we represent elements in isotopes, um, those little boxes in the periodic table are nice, but it's a more writing than what we like to do. So we can represent it with a shorthand notation, where the atomic symbol would be right here. So this X is our atomic symbol. It tells us what element we're looking at. The mass number is the first, the top superscript, so where the A is. And the atomic number is where our Z is. So this is a shorthand representation. If we were looking at bromine from the previous slide, we'd write a Br. We'd write an 80 for the mass number and a 35 for the atomic number. And this would represent bromine 80. Another example, if we take a look at this one here, we have iron. The symbol is Fe. So the Fe is uh, full sized. The number of protons, iron always has 26 protons. If you give it any different number of protons, you don't have iron anymore. So these two symbols, or these two pieces of information, always go together. For iron, Fe always goes with 26. 26 always goes with Fe. That's just the way it is. If you have an atomic number 27, it's not iron anymore. The number of neutrons, we've got to do some subtraction. So this 30 here is related to 30 plus 26, the atomic number. 
electron energy levels. So here's our Bohr model. Uh, the number of electrons in an atom is always equal to the number of protons. So for example, in a bromine atom, there are 35 electrons because the number of protons and electrons are the same. These exist in a cloud around the nucleus of an atom, but they also have a set amount of energy. So their position around the nucleus, it's not random, it depends on the amount of energy an electron has. And as an atom gains electrons, the electrons have to start, once you have more electrons, then there's a potential for more energy, and those electrons are going to start filling out different areas around that nucleus. So electrons can only have definite amounts of energy, it's measured in quanta, and this places them on specific energy levels around the nucleus of an atom. Uh, in terms of rules, and we're just going to go and memorize these rules, the first energy level only has two electrons in it ever. So if an element has more than two electrons, then you have to start filling up energy levels after the first, so at least the second or third or fourth energy level. Up to eight electrons can exist in higher energy levels, we're only going to go up to level 4, because when you get past level 4, it turns out that you can even have more electrons in energy levels outside of that. For energy level models, we can draw energy level models of atoms, and they look kind of like this here. They're going to show us the atomic symbol down here at the bottom. So this is an Mg, so Mg stands for magnesium. It shows the nucleus with protons and neutrons. So this is just information we're grabbing off the periodic table. It turns out that magnesium on average has 12 protons and 12 neutrons. I like to put the little plus sign beside the protons to remind me it's positively charged. And the electrons, we start dividing into their separate energy levels. So, up here on the top right, the first energy level is the one at the bottom. And it's allowed a maximum of two. So two electrons go in the bottom, the second energy level goes right above it. And it can at most have eight. So for magnesium, we need a total of 12 electrons because we have 12 protons. And so when we start adding them up, we have two in the first level, eight in the second, so it's a total of ten. We need two more, so we have to add a third level. And this is where we put our extra electrons. So this is an energy level, mo energy level model of magnesium. Here's a couple more energy level models. Uh, one for chlorine, one for hydrogen. Same sort of process. We go to our periodic table. We find out that chlorine's atomic number is 17. It's math, mass number, and I'm going to have to actually haul out my periodic table just to make sure I know what the mass number is. It's the joy of having a data booklet. You don't have to memorize it. And for chlorine, it's 35.45, so we round it off to 35. The difference between the two tells us that there's 18 neutrons in a chlorine atom. So this is the atomic number. Oops. and this is the mass number. When you subtract the two, you get the number of neutrons in that atom. For the number of electrons, this has to total 17, because we have 17 protons. And again, we just start filling up our energy levels. So the first energy level can only have two, because that's its maximum. The second energy level has eight, because that's only going to give us 10. We need 7 more, so that third energy level is going to have 7 electrons. We can go up to 4 levels using this rule. If we end up going above 4 levels, then our model has to change because uh, elements with more than 4 energy levels are more complicated. They need a few more rules to describe how they operate. We're not going to worry about it. So, for hydrogen, it is possible, if we take a look, here's our atomic number. It has an atomic number of 1 for hydrogen, so we have a 1 proton. It has a mass number of 1 as well, which means we have no neutrons in a hydrogen atom. Since there's 1 proton, there's only 1 electron, so it's only filling up, or it's only 
being placed in that first energy level, and that's how we get a hydrogen atom energy level model. Here we'll draw a couple more models, one for silicon and one for potassium. So the way we do this is we take a look at our periodic table, and we can find potassium. Potassium's elemental symbol is K. So we'll draw a rectangle here. And its symbol is a K. Next we're going to take a look, and I'm just going to write underneath it, it's K, it's its um, atomic number is 19, and its mass number when we round it off is 39. So here's what this tells us. It tells us that in our nucleus we have 19 protons and we have 20 neutrons. And that's the nucleus of our atom. So I'm going to draw a little circle there. And so that's our nucleus. Now we're going to fill in our energy levels. We need a total of 19 electrons. And so we start by putting 2 in the first energy level. When we add a full 8, that gives us 10. We still need 9 more. So we need 8 in the third energy level. That only gives us 18, so we need one more electron in that fourth energy level. And now we have an energy level diagram for potassium. For silicon, much the same idea. We will draw a rectangle. The symbol for silicon is SI. Let's open it SI here. And again, underneath, I'm just going to write down the information that I need. Silicon's atomic number is 14. Its mass number is 28.09, so it's going to be 28 when we round it off to the nearest whole number. So there we go. So what that means is in our nucleus, we have 14 protons and 14 neutrons, because 14 and 14 would give us our 28. There's our nucleus, and now we can fill in our electrons. We need 14 electrons, and we just start filling our energy levels in. So we get 2 in the first level, 8 in the seven le second level. That gives us 10. We need 4 more, so 4 in the third level. And there's an energy level diagram for silicon. So from this lecture, what I'm hoping you get is elements are arranged on the periodic table by atomic number. So as you go from right to left in your, or from left to right in your periodic table, the atomic number goes up. The vertical columns have elements that are, have similar physical and chemical properties. Atoms of a particular element have the same number of protons and electrons. An isotope is an element that differs in its number of neutrons. So the number of neutrons can change and you can still end up with the same element. Electrons occupy energy levels around the nucleus and we can figure out where these electrons can be by drawing energy level diagrams using uh, the Bohr idea or the Bohr atomic model. It's not quite, I guess, 100 percent correct, but it's correct enough for our purpose. We're not going to bother worrying about drawing these in a quantum model because then we got to arrange electrons in subshells and it's messy. So we're going to stick with the Bohr atomic model using the octet rule in terms of or eight electrons per shell or per energy level except for the first. The first only has two. And that's it for this lecture on or for this lesson in Bio 30 Prep.